You're listening to episode 161 of the D6 Podcast. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church, help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the family ministry podcast that helps you connect the church and home. And Ron, I'm a happy camper today. You know why? I do, because we're going to be talking about sports. No, we finally classed up the joint and got a better looking co-host in here. We did, didn't we? We uh, got, we've got. Should we our tell friend, them who's sitting here? Yeah, we've got our friend David Wilmack. Welcome, David. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, well, well I, I didn't really want to tell you this, but I guess we should do it. I've been frustrated lately. Yeah. I'm trying to look for some new help around here. I'm fired. That's what you're trying to tell me, So what me, we've right? done is I've gone to the sales department and I've uh, heard David's great on the microphone and so uh in fact he's he's a freestyle rapper so David if your tryout is to you know just cut up you know break a bar off for us real quick uh yeah okay yeah. so hey <laughs> hey we better segue we'll just, we better we'll just, segue fast we'll, we'll just hold off on that no uh we'll be getting to David in just a second but yes today we are going to be talking about ministering to parents of athletes. And yes, I love sports, so I'm very, very excited about this. And in the day and age of travel ball and everything else going on, that is a competing activity for our churches. Mm -hmm. In fact, as I poll ministry leaders, I would say that comes up one out of three times for they're competing against parents who are traveling two or three Sundays out of the month, and they don't know how to deal with that. Well, check this out. I just um, led a webinar the other day with uh, 700 ministers. Mm. Uh, and one of the things we put in there as kind of a poll yeah. was um, how often does the average family come to your church in a month? Yes. Guess what they said? One, One to two weeks I, per yeah. month is average attendance. Yes. So, yeah, and it's like you said, and as we set up last week's yeah. episode, it's not just athletics. It's um, cheerleading. Well, some people would say that's a sport. Right? Yes. Uh, and then Gymnastics, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again. Dance, yes, everything. Other things. Everything. There's other yes. activities, and, and we are um, – we're overly involved, probably. Right. Uh, and uh, and are we or are we not? Those are the things we're trying to navigate as parents. And it's great to have somebody like David Prince, who's written a book on this topic, to help us. And that's who we're talking to today. That's right. And, and I think here's the deal. If you're a lead pastor and you hear what David Prince says, if you can echo some of the principles that he will give to you very easily, if you'll echo that from your pulpit, it will begin helping your parents. Because they're torn between all of this. They know they need to be in church. Their kids are getting mixed messages. And there's a way to minister in the midst of all of this. And like I said, both my boys are athletes. And I, it is this is not a sports bashing session. David does not bash sports at all. Mm. In fact, David recognized, recognized that sports is an amazing tool to teach faith to our kids. It has been that way for me. Uh, when my sons face great challenges mm. in their sports, my son just had an injury, missed his whole season that he had been training Ooh. for. And uh, boy, you better believe we've had awesome chances to uh, to let him rely on his faith through that experience. So Absolutely. This, so that's just an example. There's so many different ways uh, that we can uh, use sports as an avenue to teach faith. That's why as churches, we can't just uh, make it an evil thing because they're no, missing church. No, no. There's a balance there to that tension. That's correct. You know, when I first went to grad school in uh, Dallas, I learned something, speaking of sports here in, in this area, their middle schools actually are given playbooks by the high schools. Mm -hmm. And the high school coaches peer down, look into the middle school in order to begin cultivating their talent for high school. I mean, the high school stadiums in Texas really look like shrines. I mean, they're they're... They're incredible. They would rival some college stadiums around the country, not the big, big teams, but others. 
I mean, high school ball in Texas is a big, big deal. They're cultivating them all the way through. Our connection that David Prince is helping us with is how to cultivate the spiritual faith beginning at the earliest ages, even in the midst of sports. I love that. But before we get to one David, I want to get to another David. David Womack uh, is with Randall House. He's with the sales department. So we brought him in because he's answering these kind of questions all day. And you you had something you wanted to bring up with him. I did. You know, we said that as we go into the summer, we, we cut back to one interview as opposed to two interviews on the podcast. We'll maintain that schedule through the summer because we know people are going nonstop. David, you deal with, I mean, you're a consultant. I mean, people call you up, pick your brain, you and your team, and you help churches solve problems on a regular basis. And I've heard you talk about this before. There are churches out there that want to provide a tool for their parents while they're on the go, while they're vacationing, all of that. What is your answer for that as as pastors who are frustrated going, okay, my attendance is about to dip. We're debating whether or not to pull back in certain areas, and we know we can't pull back entirely. What, what are some answers for that, David? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we do get that question quite often because everyone knows that life is busy, but especially in the summer, it seems that it just goes to a, another level of busyness. Not only do you have... Uh, sports and everything going on. You have uh, families taking vacation, and we certainly want families to have time that they can enjoy each other and some leisure. Uh, But the question is, how do we keep our discipleship emphasis going during those times that we are pulled out of church for whatever those reasons might be? And so a great tool we offer for that are our devotional study guides. Uh, We have those guides that are available for every age. So each member of the family has their own devotional study guide. Not only does it have their devotions that they can stay on track, it has articles, games, and things like that that maintains their interest. Uh, And so it's easy for a family, even a family on the go, that they can continue to have their daily devotions, which provides an on-ramp for conversations in the home around God's Word. Are the uh, the devotional study guides for the parents, does it give them natural segues to have those conversations? It does provide, uh, there's a home connection section in each of the devotional study guides for the adults, the parents. And it offers uh, suggested questions you can ask your your children, your, your teenagers, uh, so that you're getting them pulled into the conversation around the themes that you're studying together in your devotions. Yes. Now, if you're like me, I run through the Starbucks drive through probably two or three times a week. Now, I, I know some people are in there absolutely every mm-hmm. day, but I'm going to tell you, for most families, you can afford the entire three months of summer for one week of Starbucks budget. Yes. very. So you're talking about for the price of a Starbucks coffee, the average coffee is going to cover one of those devotional study guides. Right. Is that right, David? That'll, and that'll last you 13 weeks. Correct. And so I would encourage you to... to Contact David's staff and say, hey, here's the ages of my my family. You can order them individually. You don't have to order them as a church. But if your whole church did, imagine what you'd look like on the other side of summer if you kept this going and you had family-aligned conversations like David's talking about here. Exactly. Because everybody is studying the same biblical theme. Is that correct? Everyone, ever from elementary age all the way up through adults, everyone is on the same theme every week. Just trying to make it easy to fulfill that Deuteronomy 6 mandate that you're instilling in your children and your family while you're going by the way, while you're rising up, lying down, just as you're doing life, not only are you uh, speaking truth, but you're taking advantage of those spontaneous, uh, teachable moments as they occur in life. So I'm going to challenge all the listeners, go out there right now and order these and see what a difference it makes for you in three months. If you like it, keep it going. Again, the cost on this is so insignificant, but it's going to allow for natural, connectional conversations that I think you would pay 10 times that amount for to have those conversations Absolutely. with your kids. Yes, David, thanks for answering our question today. Thank you. You did a great job. In fact, during the break, I'm going to talk to David about his future as my future co-host. And uh, Told you, you I was are being going fired. To, you are going to get ready to hear from David Prince, who's going to be talking to us about ministering to parents of athletes. We'll see you on the other side of the break. What if you could multiply your ministry 168 times over? We have a way for you to do that today. We believe that true discipleship is attained through diligently studying God's Word and applying the Scriptures to your daily life. Spending one hour each week out of 168 in a worship service is simply not enough. D6 Devotional Study Guides are here to help. 
Each week, everyone in your family studies the same theme, with lessons and devotions appropriate to each age level. Moms and dads will love the devotions and articles as conversation starters. Children will love reading and playing games in their own devotional study guide. Families will love spending time together during the week discussing and studying the scriptures. To learn more about the D6 devotional magazines, you can go to d6family.com slash d6 curriculum. Mr. David Prince. Welcome, sir. Glad to be back. Uh, David has served as pastor of preaching and vision at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky since 2003. Now, don't let that make you believe he's anything but an Alabama fan. Roll Tide. (laughs) And he does that every time I see him. It's annoying because I'm from Nashville and enjoy Tennessee and... It's just really sad. Uh, <laughs> sad for me, not sad for you. You're having a great decade. Yeah, you, you learn how to deal, deal with pride since you win all the time as a Bama fan. <laughs> Tell them, go ahead and drop that uh, Nick Saban stat since we're talking Alabama real quick. Well, uh, yeah, the stat we were talking about was Nick Saban has won more national championships at Alabama than he has lost home football games. That's right. Now, I wanted you to get out because we don't know when this is going to be played and we don't know what's going to happen this season, so maybe you just jinxed him. <laughs> Yes! So if you've heard this and they've lost a home game, just know that was because I got him to do that. There we go. Uh, But no, uh, David is not just uh, in that position. He's also the assistant professor of Christian preaching at the the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary where he earned a PhD in theology. I laugh because it was like the Ohio State. Dr. Moeller will not like it if you leave out the the. Okay, I got it. I'm with you. (laughs) So uh, he has been married to Judy since 1992 and they have eight children. And I laughed at that too for obvious reasons (laughs) because it's eight. Right. (laughs) But hey, congratulations. We love it. Um, His most recent book, is in the arena the promise of sports for Christian discipleship, which is kind of what brings you to D6. You are our resident crazy sports parent minister. Okay. <laughs> and, and you're my resident crazy sports parent counselor because I am one. Uh, All right. And so that's what I'd like to kind of chat about. I mean, last time we talked, we did talk about sports parents, but I wanted this to feel more like a sequel. So uh, your book, In the Arena, gives a biblical perspective on sports. So that means I get to ask you questions and get help because my sons play sports. And sometimes I get confused and sometimes I get out of control and sometimes I yell at referees and some, I just need help. So uh, let's start with this. What if I have a kid who is actually really good at a certain sport? How do I walk the fine line of supporting their God-given gift and then uh, without going overboard with unnecessary training and too much time and money spent on developing that gift? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, w- one of the categories I think everybody should keep in mind is that in dealing with uh, sports, it should always be about more than sports. Uh, and so that doesn't really uh, matter whether your kid is gifted or not gifted at sports. It should always be more. Uh, there should always be more going on to your commitment to and involvement in it than other than just the sports. It's always about what we learn about ourselves. I like to say that uh, sports do not build character. Sports expose character. And for those who are looking to build their character, it provides a really good environment to do that. And so if, you're, if your son or daughter is really gifted, Uh, you ought to encourage them to work really hard at it. But as a parent, a part of what you're doing that you don't feel sorry for yourself for having to do is teaching them how to prioritize their life. And so there are certain things that we're committed to and uh, our faith and uh, church and um, the being in the word and those sorts of things. And so we don't want to compromise that. Uh, And yet we want to do everything we do to the glory of God. And so you as a parent is, are helping them uh, think that out. And, and I, I don't think that you ever want to say, hey, you, you know, you're not working hard enough at it. Uh, maybe occasionally. I have one kid that loves to read and I have to say, would you put that book down and go outside and play something? <laughs> and so you might have a kid to say, hey, let's back off and let's, let's do this. But, but usually it's teaching them how and when to do it. I have a daughter who likes to go hit an hour's worth of serves before school in the morning. 
-hmm. That's by her own choice. She knows she's got responsibilities with school and that she's got uh, church responsibilities that she doesn't want to miss, but she wants to get better at tennis. And so she chooses to get up before school, which means she gets up about 5.30 and we go to the tennis club and she hits for an hour and uh, then she goes to school. Uh, And so you're helping them sort those things out. And uh, on, on the teams my kids have been on, for instance, we just don't generally skip church to play sports. And so we just are up front with the coaches or leagues. If you don't want my kid on the team because of that, we understand that and we're not mad about that. Uh, But I've always had a good reception to those things. But when I think about my kid, well, I'm teaching them as I'm guiding them through this. This is how you do with your life. Just like grades in school. There's more than the letter that ends up on the sheet of paper. There's character development. And that's true whether your child is very intellectually gifted uh, academically or whether they're not. And so being the person that helps remind them that there's always more going on here than sports is, I think, key. Uh, And, you know, as as they get a little older, though, I mean, you know, when they're younger, oh, I'm so proud of you. Enjoyed watching you play. You're a little kind of, you're kind of like, that's my kid, you know, (laughs) that's my son. And there's, as a parent, that's kind of about the extent of it. But as they get older, 12, 13 years old, people start to say, there's there's just a different way of looking at them. Um, if they're talented. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I guess that's, you know, it it becomes, you start to ask yourself, uh, adults are seeing him as an asset and I'm not sure how much I enjoy that and how much do I need to advocate and how much do I need to let him stand up for himself and decisions of how he's going to operate and teams he's going to be on, all that stuff. Yeah, and I think you're right to think about that in terms of a, a scale depending on age. Of course, when they're younger, uh, you're going to put, put up with far less as far as a, a coach that may be acting inappropriately or saying demeaning things or things like that. And the older they get, the more you're going to let them sort that out. Uh, in fact, uh, you even, I think, as a parent, uh, ought to want some of those things to happen hmm. so you can help them through them before they happen without you. Yeah. Uh, because not everybody in the work world is going to treat them well. They're going to have to deal with bad bosses. They're going to have to deal with people who are trying to get ahead of them in ungodly ways. The question is, how are they going to respond to that? And so I think if we are too quick to step in, uh, and instead of coaching them how to get through it and how to stand up for themselves or, or deal with the issues that we're always stepping in front of them, uh, I think we're kind of hindering uh, the ability to raise them in a way that prepares them for life. Uh, mm. I, I counsel a lot of college students. We have a lot of college students at our church. And to be perfectly honest with you, most of them have been ill-prepared uh, for their college years because uh, they've largely had parents that have been totally their advocates but haven't really parented them with an idea that they're going to be off on their own one day. Mm. And I've got to use the time I've got to prepare them to leave. Uh, I'm preparing to send them out. I'm not preparing the, uh, to keep them. And a lot of times parents parent out of their own neediness. It makes me feel good to step in front and deal with everything uh, rather than out of what's in the best interest of the child. I, I honestly have situations that come up and they're, you know, they're not anything that uh, you would say, well, this is a good thing. But I say to myself, I'm glad we're going through this where I can help them think about this in the right way. Mm, that's a great attitude. That's not just sports. That's just life and yeah, parenting. And- exactly. Let me, one other thing that we have tended to do is, uh, let's say I do think the coach is across the line with behavior or the way they talk and things. Well, I'll coach my child how to deal with that. And then I might go to the coach privately without my child even knowing I go to the coach and say, hey, I don't really like what's going on here or help me understand why you're doing this. And my child never even knows that conversation happened mm. because I'm, I'm, I'm pur- I purposely trying not to undercut the authority of the coach. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying not to have the kid... Uh, my child think that I'm going to run in front of them all the time. Mm. So I I think there's a way you can handle that and deal with things you need to deal with, but not, but still allow your child to have the room to grow uh, and, and be navigating it in their mind on their own as well. What about if uh, something happens in a game, things are intense, maybe you don't like a decision the coach made or you don't like the referees or anything. And you just start, you just want to just spout off in front of your kid 
Yeah. Because uh, I do that. Well, at times. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not good, right? <laughs> my, my rule with coaches is, is the, uh, the coach is always right, even if he's wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless he is doing something uh, immoral or ungodly or calling you to do something immoral or ungodly, as far as making out the lineup, the coach is right. Yeah. And he's right even if he's dead wrong. Yeah. Uh, because the reason he's right is he's making out the lineup. Yeah. And uh, you've got to respond to that. If, most coaches want to win, and they think that if you brought them the value, they'd write your name in the lineup or they'd put you in this position. It's not their job to figure that out. It's your job to show them that you ought to be yeah. on the field or in the lineup at a particular place. So the coach is always right, uh, as long as it's not immoral or ungodly. Uh, and I want my kids to have that view of things and a respect, proper respect for authority uh, because, uh, you know, if I teach them to only respect authority when uh, the authority does what they want them to do, well, I'm actually teaching them to be rebellious against me <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. Because uh, they, That's believe me, point. my kids don't always like uh, the decisions I make. Mm. And what I tell my kids is, I'm going to be wrong. I'm just going to be right more than you. <laughs> so you, you're better off doing what I ask you to do. Mm-hmm. And it's usually that way with coaches and things like that. And as far as officials, uh, I say officials never win or lose games. There's always countless other things that could have happened, so I don't complain about officials. Mm. I, I need to – I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm here to count you your like brother. You're like my Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, so what, what do I do if my kids display in a bad attitude? Yeah. Well, in sports, <laughs> that, that's that's the most important thing to address. Uh, I, I think as a parent, you're either helping your child become a better person through sports or you're helping them uh, to have a deformed character through sports. And you're either helping them become a better athlete or you're hurting their ability in athletics because a lot of parents teach their children to be fixated on the things that they can't control outcome, performance, success. Nobody can control that. Uh, There are some things that you can control. Uh, What I tell my kids, uh, it's you control effort, energy, self-sacrifice, honor, and attitude. Those are the Mm. things you control. Uh, And if you do those things and you do them right, uh, then you're either going to win or you're going to lose. And you're going to try to win, but you can, you can lose and know that uh, you gave it your best and you've learned things uh, to try to help you win the next time. Mm-hmm. But if the parent fixates on the refs and performance and we didn't win, and you're actually inhibiting your child's athletic ability because nothing is more detrimental to an athlete than to uh, nervously fixate on things they can't control. Athletics is always this tension between being very focused and very loose, (laughs) which is a a difficult combination to master. And so the only way you can master it is I focus on the things that I have the ability to control. So on the car ride home, uh, those are the kinds of things you can talk about uh, Mm -hmm. or should talk about. You know, I tell my kids they're good goods. That's good attitude, good work ethic, good result. There are good bads, that's good attitude, uh, good work ethic, bad result. Uh, There are bad goods, that's bad attitude, bad work ethic, uh, good result, right? Sometimes you have bad attitude, but you still get it done. That's actually the worst thing that can happen. So you have to deal with the attitude is more important than the result. And then there are bad bads. You got a bad attitude and you got a bad result. Mm. And so uh, I try to get my kids to think in those sorts of categories. Uh, not too long ago, I had uh, my daughter tell me after a, a match, she said, Dad, that was a bad good. Mm. She said, I wasn't really focused. I was better than the girl, so I knew I was going to win. And so I, I wasn't doing the things I needed to do to get better, even though I won. Mm. Yeah, that, that's the way I want her to what think about win. it. What a win. What a win. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's good. All right, so what do I do if my kid wants to quit during the season? Are you a stick-it-until-the-end philosophy person, or do you have room in your philosophy for a kid who doesn't need to keep trying? Yeah, I I would say that as a general rule, I'm a stick-it-to-the-end if you start, 
because one season, a few months of something um, is something most of us can do. And if we make a commitment, we ought to have a general rule that we keep it. I, I don't, that's not a, a thus saith the Lord maxim though. I could see situations where it might make sense uh, not, to, not to press on, but I would think those are very few. Um, as a general rule, I think, you know, and not all kids are going to resonate with all sports in the same way. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody, nobody's even got to be into sports. Yeah. There are families that aren't. But I would say this, if you're not into sports, you need something else that you're into as a family mm-hmm. that's outside of the things that you directly do to do with your faith. I had Sinclair Claire Ferguson, the theologian pastor, tell me one time, one of the advice he gives seminary students with families, and it was tie more than one cord to your children. In other words, tie your faith to your children, but find something else that you tie to your children that you're teaching them to understand the faith through. Well, mm-hmm. in my family, that's sports. Uh, because he said, sometimes your relationships with your ch- children might get off uh, on a wrong track, but you've still got the other. Mm-hmm. And, and you've connected the other to the faith. And so um, he said, one mistake that a lot, of, a lot of pastors and a lot of seminary type people make is uh, they don't tie the, those other cords to their children. Mm. And it's just a recognition we live in community and we live in a particular place. Where I'm from, uh, they really love football. And I learned to love baseball there too. Mm. Okay, well, let's, speaking of your book, In the Arena, even though we didn't speak of it yet, I want to. Please speak of it. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this book, I, I've told you already, I, I feel like you have just found a cool niche where we needed somebody to have a voice uh, sports, uh, talking about sports, which has kind of just gone through this culture just so rapidly. Uh, and we don't have enough people speaking from a faith perspective yeah. about it. So I think it's cool. Please tell people about your book. And I want to just speak as you're listening to this, to the children's and youth ministers, there's certain families in your church that you know Sports is a dividing topic for you, maybe because you have made the mistake of guilting families for being gone to do sports or that making them think sports is, uh, that, that it's a divisive thing for you. I, I might ask you to consider buying this as a peace treaty, as an as a olive leaf to yeah. say, hey, you know what? I got this book. I, I actually think that what you're doing is kind of a mission thing, and I, and I want to support you. Yeah. Here's a book. Uh, but tell us more about the book. Yeah, well, I, I think the adversarial attitude is a really bad idea mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, if you went to a missionary to another culture, you'd be looking for things that were cultural things that draw diverse groups of people together as entry points uh, for the gospel. Uh, well, you don't have to look very hard in America. Sports is uh, uh, ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Even people who aren't into sports are connected with sports because people they know are are into sports. And, and so I think an adversarial attitude is, is a bad idea. And e- even the Bible keeps using, the, especially the Apostle Paul's sports imagery to connect it with our faith. And so the book came about because I was converted when I was a 19-year-old in college playing baseball. And the first question I thought after I was converted was, should I still keep playing baseball? What should I do? How do I make sense of this? And uh, I started trying to find out. I've always been a guy who liked to read. And, okay, I'm going to read good books on this topic. Well, uh, I couldn't find any. <laughs> I, I either found um, books that either kind of just sort of were very uh, superficial kind of rah-rah uh, uh, about sports, just basically play for Jesus if you're a Christian. Well, that's a good advice, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to be uh, negative toward that. Or the, the church just largely doesn't de- hasn't dealt with sports. Uh, better the area, areas in the past where uh, there were dialogue about sports, pro and con, but at least they were dialoguing about it. We have an era where it's all over the place, but very few people are talking about it through the lens of faith. And so from that point on, I began to talk about it, think about it. I was a, I was a coach. I became a coach after I put, stopped playing baseball in college. And then I became a seminary student. Then I became a pastor. And then I became a professor. And for all that window, I've been thinking about that issue. And so I just decided to sit down and, and put that on paper, sort of the, the path that God has taken me and the thoughts that I have as someone who uh, has a PhD in theology, but trying to write it in a very accessible way to, to, to people in the context of the church to say, listen, you know, people in your church, for example, misuse money. 
So you don't get up and say, since you misuse money, we don't, you, you shouldn't have any money. Nobody should have any money. In fact, as a church, don't give us any money. You never heard a pastor say that, have you? <laughs> no. So yeah, there are all kinds of people who misuse sports. When I was a kid, it was an idol in my life. Uh, but just because they misuse it doesn't mean it's not a good vehicle. Mm -hmm. And when you think about, if, if I were to say, okay, let's think about what Jesus was like. And we, we say, well, he was passionate. He had a singleness of purpose when he set his face toward Jerusalem. He was willing to endure difficulty for the mission he was on. He was self-sacrificial. Well, those are all things Paul mentions in the context of sports in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And so probably things that we ought to as as moms and dads and as pastors be linking to sports in our own context, which is a point of contact that our congregation, uh, almost all of them have. And so as a church, I don't, I don't even blame a lot of the families who are struggling or even making poor decisions, prioritizing sports over uh, church or, or quitting sports because they think they have to to be involved in church. I really blame guys like me, pastors, because... How many times have you heard of discipleship classes about this issue? Mm. How many times have you heard these matters addressed from the pulpit in anything other than kind of taking an adversarial shot at sports? You know, mm. the, the whole, you guys know the batting averages, but you don't know the gospel of Mark. Uh, well, that, that's just generally a, a bad strategy uh, yeah. if you're trying to help those people. And uh, it, it's frankly not a strategy the Bible takes on mm. this issue. And so we probably ought to let the Bible be our guide and use the point of contact and leverage it with all we've got. And so that's what I'm trying to do in the book. Okay, let's, let's think about our lives as, as, as followers of Christ and let's think about how uh, our interest in sports intersects with that. And let's draw those connections and, and let's just make sure we don't abstract sports from our faith. Mm. And by the way, I think both groups that are totally different places do that. You have the group that's totally dismissive. Of course, I'm not interested in sports. I'm spiritual. Or you have the group that is totally invested in sports, but they treat it like a guilty pleasure, almost like they're on a diet and sports is sneaking chocolate. <laughs> I know I shouldn't be this interested in this, but I am. Uh, but both of them are doing the same thing from the opposite direction. They're acting like this has nothing to do with their faith. They're not taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Hmm. Wow. You, you nailed that last one. That was good. That was good. <laughs> Hey, thanks for being with us. Um, your website is davidprince.com. If you guys are interested, you can go there. I'm sure you can find the book, and you have blogs. You have awesome stuff. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Glad to be with you. Uh, in my D6 uh, session on uh, sports here, I, I did some material that I haven't put out there before that's going to be on my website here shortly. Awesome. Hi, this is Rob Reno with Visionary Family Ministries. Do you have a plan for helping your children and grandchildren love and follow Jesus? I have to confess that for the first 10 years of our family life, I was adrift. I didn't have a clear picture of God's purpose for our family, but it's never too late with God. He used his word in my life to turn my heart to my children and to give Amy and me a shared vision and purpose for our home and specific action steps that we could take to do all in our power to help our children love and follow God. Amy and I share the ups and downs of our journey and the scriptures that transformed our family in our book, Visionary Parenting. And I'm convinced God can use the same scriptures that transformed our family to transform yours. Jeremy, excellent, excellent interview with David. I, I, I know how you guys connect. You're the right person to interview him. And again, if you're listening, you need to forward the link to this podcast to every parent who has a child in sports and uh, make sure your lead pastor is hearing this as well. Yeah, uh, such an important topic. We need to talk about more and more. And uh, thanks again to David Prince. He is very generous with his knowledge on this topic. Speaking of folks that are knowledgeable on a topic, when it comes to the idea of co-parenting, in fact, um, Jay and Tammy Daughtry will be our guests next week, 
And Tammy's the one who taught me that term co-parenting. I, I was going to say, every time we say that, I, I want to define it because yeah. I, that was a new term for me too. It, well, it's the idea of when a couple goes through a divorce and uh, they obviously are no longer operating as husband and wife, but yet they still are uh, parents if they have a child. And so in that s- scenario, um, Tammy has coined that phrase to kind of um, help them understand that they still have a relationship, even though they are not uh, married uh, anymore. They are co-parenting. That's right. Because one of the biggest tensions, and, and uh, let me confess, we will deal with this next week as well. I'm I'm a child of divorce. And one of the challenges of that is I've got not a completely different set of rules, but a different set of expectations in one home versus another home. And oftentimes that divorce set of parents don't talk to each other about the intentionality or the collaboration of parenting with the child they still share. Even though they don't share a marriage, they still share parenting. Yes. And that's what Jay and Tammy are so brilliant at helping us understand how to establish that in broken families. And not only um, are they... um educated on this. They've actually experienced it themselves. Yes. So we're we're talking about people who really can help those that find themselves in the situation of divorce, uh, single parenting, or blended family. Yes. All of those um, are going to be discussed next week. Again, another episode that you'll be able to forward to certain families in your ministry that are really going through this and need some encouragement. So we'll be looking forward to that uh, and hope you guys will be looking forward to a great week of ministry. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.